group of students in another course which I teach you that 105 about um, technology and I think it would be a very a good place, a critical lens to end the year on, things to think about. People think that technology is the silver, they have been thinking this for a long time in secondary schools. Um, they probably thought that the ball point 10 was a big step forward, that was the new technology of not so many years ago. Um, so thinking critically about what technology can and cannot do for us going forward in our time is, is a good place for you for you to be. So thank you, Jamie. Thank you for your time. Thank you for thank your you. expertise. And look, here they are. They're all yours. Yeah. The stage drifting. That's a good thing. <laughs> um, is, is that OK, or is it better with like that? Either one? Yeah. I might just leave that light on then. Is that better? Okay. So kia ora everyone. As Brian said, my name's Jamie and it's my pleasure to come and speak with you all today. Um, so my work at the moment is I'm working as a curriculum design manager within the business school. Um, and I'll go through a little bit in a moment about who I am, where I come from, what my background is. Uh, but I'm also a PhD student here within education and social work. So I'm working full-time and PhD part-time at the same time. Um, so before we get into it, I'd like to just quickly share the whakatauki on screen, which roughly translates to look back and reflect so that you can move forward. And that's going to be a big kind of theme of today, and it's a big theme of everything I do, which is looking back to make sense of what's there so that we can actually make the right steps moving onwards from, from that position. As we go through today, feel free to shout out if there's any questions or anything that come up. Don't feel like you've got to wait till the end. It's a pretty small group, so we can make it a bit more interactive and have a bit more fun. I wasn't sure how many we'd end up with, so I kind of organised some of the activities for a larger group, so we'll probably get them done reasonably quickly, in which case we might have a bit more time to kind of just chat and talk about the things that are on top of mind for you. Okay. Um, there will be some activities that we'll do through the session, which I, I wanted to try and set myself the, a bit of a challenge that the session was only going to use one technological tool. Okay, so I was going to try and do everything through just one tool. Um, so, yeah, it's very, very simple to say, Oh, we'll jump into this thing for this, this thing for this, this thing for this. But it was like, actually, let's do the whole session in one thing. Okay, so obviously there's heaps and heaps of different tools, and that's part of what we're talking about today is why choose those tools when you're teaching? What's the purpose of choosing that tool? What are you trying to achieve? You know, what's the benefit of there? Okay, so if you've got a laptop, would obviously be the best but a phone or tablet would be the second best. Um, but if you can get on the internet and then just head to the Canvas site for this course, and you won't see a lot at the moment, but if you go into the modules, you'll see at the very bottom this session. And there'll just be kind of two pages there at the moment. And as we go through, I'll just publish more pages. Okay? So you'll have to refresh and more pages will pop up. All good so far? Cool. Got it, welcome. So while you're doing that, so while, while you're on getting that all sorted, I'll just give you a little bit of a background about myself. I actually initially trained as a secondary teacher, doing the graduate diploma in teaching back in the late 90s. And I finished off that, so that was at the end of 99, I finished that. And I actually decided not to go into teaching straight away. I went back to university, I did some more upskilling, and I ended up teaching instead at a polytech down in Hamilton. So rather than go into secondary teaching, I moved into tertiary teaching instead. And for me, and I know you've had this journey yourself, that year, my grad diploma year, was probably one of the best ones in setting myself up for everything I've done since. It was hard, and the year after, when I first started teaching, or the, the year after I upskilled and started teaching, was very, very hard. But it was fantastic, and a lot of the skills I learnt 
I'm still using all the time now. So, and what it did was it set me up and I was very keen in what I was teaching. I was really passionate about the thing I was teaching. But while I was down in Hamilton, down in the Polytech that I was teaching at, and I did that for about six years, I got more interested in how I was teaching. I was more interested in the pedagogy. I got less interested in about the content and far more interested in the ways I was teaching and how could I do something more innovative, more interesting, more um, different. And this interest led me towards technologies, digital technologies, because what I wanted to do was I, was, I wanted to enhance my students' experience in my classes, but also my personal experience in my classes as well. Because that was a bit of a win-win. If they enjoy it, and I enjoy it, it's going to be great. And where I really enjoy it is when students are doing stuff, and they're busy, and they're loud, and they're noisy. And so when I hear all this current conversation around should we ban schools, uh, ban phones and stuff in schools, I actually, internally, I scream a bit. Because I'm like, no, don't ban it. Use it. Like, if they're texting on it, you've stopped using the right tool. You've got this amazing computer in your hand. Use it. Teach them through it. And that's, where I get, uh, that's what I got really, really fascinated about. Um, and I, that led me into a Master's of Education and more and more sort of practicing and teaching and stuff. Around 2015, I ended up leaving teaching. My mum got very sick with terminal cancer and I left to nurse her during the last few days. Um, and when I left that, I took on what, a role that's called a learning designer. It's a learning designer. It's not a very well-known role, but it's basically a job that means I was designing courses and I was designing teaching, but I wasn't doing the teaching. And that gave me the flexibility to be involved in education, to be working with lecturers, to say to them, why are you teaching it that way? What do you want to achieve? What's your students meant to achieve? Having those kind of critical conversations. But I didn't have to be in a class, so I could still be flexible and go to all these appointments with my mum. And that is what led me to the uni here, where I originally worked in the Faculty of Education here. Then I went to AUT for a few years, then back to the uni. And now in my current job, I work with these business schools large international facing programs uh, and my job is to work with the academic staff especially on their teaching and learning with digital technologies and improving their assessment practices. My research, the second hat I wear, is all around when we take the teacher out of the teaching space and we start using more technologies, what happens to their professional identity? You know, we've taken them out of the classroom, we've got them just talking to a screen. How does that change how they feel about who they are and what they do? And that's my kind of research hat that I use as well. So I'm going to be talking to you with a bit of both of those on. Okay? And later on, I'll open up this on our Canvas course if you want to have a look through. Up to you, but it's just kind of a bit of info about myself. So, the next slide. And I built this for a lot more people than are here today, but we're going to give it a try anyway. I'm going to get you, as a small group, and I was going to do it by these teams by letters. I think we're just going to do it by sort of the clusters you're in. We're going to go to a Padlet, and you've got five minutes. There's ten categories. And you're going to upload the best whatever you categorize as the best photo for each of those categories. Okay? And then after that five minutes, we're going to vote on whose photo is the best for each of those categories. So let me just open that up for you. Okay, so if you refresh your canvas, you should be able to see that page now, the icebreaker page. About halfway down, there'll be a link to the Padlet, and if you just open that up, you should get this.
If one know what we're going to do? Yep. So, I might, I might go, actually this group here can take my A to F letters. I might just get you working with the, the girls here. Oh, you need to, oh, okay. Oh, I can, I can try. <laughs> okay, G and L, G to L. And you guys at the back, whatever that next letter after that will be, which will be M to about R, I think, or P. Just so the three at the back. Okay? All right, go for it. We've got five minutes. Yep, all G to L. Oh, three at the back. You're the... Yeah, you're at the back. You don't have to get all 10, just get the ones that appeal to you. What group are we? M to R. Oh, there we go, first photo up. You choose. All good. <laughs> That's right. That's why we have these icebreakers. Um, I'm not sure about the cat as the best food picture. I know you guys are students. Okay, that's better. That's better. I'm a lot happier now. Octopus flavored ice cream. Oh. Oh.
cute cat that just turned up. <laughs> Somebody's pet? Oh. <laughs> Whose car's that? <laughs> Okay, one minute left. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. Okay, so now we've got our photos up. <laughs> we've got a lot of cats. <laughs> that is an incredibly weird looking Z tree, which I think is in the wrong place, but that's okay. We'll leave that as is. Who's this? That's me. Was uh, Willie Mason, he's a very famous NRL player from a couple of years Brilliant. ago. Brilliant. Okay, so what I want you to do now is if you go through, you'll see this little love heart on each of the things. You should be able to just click on it. So I want you to click on the one that you want to vote for in each category. Okay, so you're voting for what's the best one in each category. And I'll just give you a few minutes to do that. No problem, no problem. Hi there. Oh, that's okay. These things happen. We're just finishing up a bit of an icebreaker. Okay. So, um, if you can just jump on, if you've got a laptop, that'd be great. And if you just head into the, the canvas page for this course, yes. what will happen is during the session, we slowly release more and more of the modules. Okay. Uh, sorry, more and more pages within the module. Yeah. But head in there. Oh, you'll be able to join in with us pretty soon. My name's Jamie, by the way. I'm Katerina. Nice to meet you. Ooh. That's so, so that's, that's Wim from under Andy Green. That is so I didn't see this before, and I'm not sure we count it as a pet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that either. I need to zoom in a bit. That, I think, is my favorite picture. This tree here. <laughs> it's the only thing I'm going to vote for. Uh, you should be able to scroll sideways across the page, and then each category will scroll up and down. Uh, 
Oh, okay. All right. Okay. That should be our time. So, someone else who can see it a bit easier. What's our best, what's our most voted for? This seems to be getting a lot of votes. Yeah, that, that seems to be a great one. Um, there's a lot of cats going on. <laughs> a lot of cats going on, which is, it's the internet, so it's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> Again, the Z is everywhere, and I don't know what's happening to that. <laughs> Because I don't think it's in the Z category. The one category that says something that begins with the letter Z doesn't have it. <laughs> cool. All right. So we just carry on from there. Okay, so I want to start the session properly with a little bit of a story around how technology has grown and how it's changed and how it's impacted on both society and education. Okay? So, I, I was born in 1975, and that was the same year that this beast arrived. Okay? This is the IBM 5100, and it was one of the first ever commercially available portable computers. Okay? It weighed 25 kgs. It was in a massive typewriter type case, and it cost between 9,000 and 20,000 US dollars, um, could display 16 lines of text only on this little screen, and yeah, that was pretty much all it could do. And at the time, it was a huge improvement on what had come beforehand, because what had come before were computers that took over a whole building, were 27,000 kilograms in weight, and over half a million dollars. But we can actually see it in, in action. So have a look at this dinosaur in action. The speed of it powering up. That's pretty much all it could do. Display text. No. So, in contrast, my youngest niece, she was born in 2008, okay? Her world that she got born into, she already had the MP3 file format. That was, a, that was 15 years before she was born. And that led to all of our Spotify, all of our streaming, all of that media. Sony had brought out the PlayStation 1 about 14 years before she was born. That revolutionised home entertainment. Zuckerberg had put Facebook out four years before. That was our, kind of our explosion into social media. And the first iPhone had come out a year before. What she grew up with was portable miniature computers, like the PlayStation 3, getting this kind of graphics and work instead. So this is the difference between sort of one generation, you know, from my birth to her birth, this is the, the change we've seen in that very short, short time. And what that's done is we've seen both the size of the device change, so it's got smaller and smaller and smaller, and some of you might be a bit too young to realize that cell phones got really small, then we realized we could watch videos on them, and they started getting big again. But for a little while there, they were tiny. And then they got graphical interfaces and they got large again. They became really affordable, they became yeah, really prevalent. It's unusual not to see somebody with a device in some way. Now you walk along, 
usually someone's got a phone in their hand, they're using a tablet in some way, or they've got a laptop when they're in a cafe or something like that. And what it's done is it's all these technologies that we've had have completely changed in society how we think, how we work, how we live, and how we play, and how we communicate. You know, I couldn't tell you the last person I phoned. I've got a phone. I don't want to tell you how much screen time I use each day. <laughs> but if I look at the call history, there's probably nothing there for, from about a month. I don't communicate in that way anymore. You know, it's just, and is anyone different than that? Yeah, a few of you? But you know what I mean, like, like there's a, what, four out of the whole group here? <laughs> it's pretty wild. And even our, the ways we consume media now, this is just news reports. Like we've got all this augmented reality happening. We've got all of this high-tech stuff. And this is not new. This is older material. Like this is 2011. Um, but it's not good enough for us anymore to just see this presenter on screen. We can't just take in information in that way. Our whole world has sort of changed in that way. And one of the things we've found is this massive blurring between the lines of what's digital, what's physical, and what's biological. And part, one of the bits, so jumping into my research part now, is um, what we're finding is one of the big thinkers, Donna Haraway, back in 1992, said that humans were going to become more like cyborgs. We were going to constantly have devices that we were interacting with. You know, we're going to become this combination of human and machine. She didn't mean in like a sci-fi way where we actually physically melded to it. But she was absolutely right, and that was 1992 she was talking about that. And she's absolutely right. Um, and that's where, right at the very start, when we were talking about, you know, I kind of had a miniature rant about you know, banning schools, phones from schools. If I lose my phone, I get really anxious. Like if, I, if someone takes the phone away from you, you know, you're so used to it being in the hand, it's so used to being nearby you. Yeah. Yeah. It is. But it's what they do all the time, all the time, constantly. No, and I agree with what you're saying. But when they leave the classroom, when we have no control over them anymore, what are they going to do? We can't, you know, we have no control over that. And what we're trying to control is the, the short time in which we have them. Right? And uh, it's still meant to be influential. Yep. On students' lives. Yep. And we could make a difference by giving them an electric energy on an electronic device. Okay. Now, the, the question there is is the dependency on the electronic device still there? Yes. And, and, and if you want to really get into all the psychological changes that mm. are taking place and the skeletal changes to the What I'm, what I'm saying is I have control over, so myself as a tertiary educator, yeah. I have influence over about two hours of that person's life yeah. once a week. To say you can't use your phone for two hours of that week, that's pointless because how many other hours have you got? Like in that day alone, you've got 22 more hours that you're probably but interacting with someone. Environment, then you'd still make the rules. But yep. And I'm not saying that, that it's a wonderful device. I'm not saying it's the godsend for everything. But I'm saying it's had such an impact on, on society that it's, it's actually quite strange how little impact it's had on education. So 
Yeah, we've revolutionised society completely with technology. Well, it's different. So we can argue semantics, yeah, yeah. but it's changed. Yeah, yeah. So the society that exists now is different than the one that was previous. Okay. Yeah. And so do we want to get students ready for this new world? Or do we not? <laughs> and that is not a question that I'm going to answer because I don't have the answer to it. Yeah. <laughs> but what, I'm, what I am saying is that the world has changed, education hasn't. This picture here, 1980. This picture here, about 2010. Actually, probably a bit later than that, given the devices they're using. Only the, thing, the things that have changed are superficial. The kids using a book here, they're taking notes on a laptop here. Not a lot has actually changed. They're still in rows. They're still looking at the front of the room. There's still a thing for them to look at at the front of the room that they're doing their work off. Is it right? I don't know. Should we question it? Probably. Yeah. Because the reality is it hasn't changed. Yeah, and we look at the tools being used pre-COVID, this is just pre-COVID, in schools, YouTube, Google, PowerPoint, Twitter, LinkedIn, not as much in schools, that's more tertiary, Google, Word, Wikipedia, yeah, pretty low level tech. It's not exactly big stuff. And then COVID hit. So what do we do? OK, everyone, jump on a screen and watch the performance again. Yeah, We didn't have a transformation or change or whatever word we want to use if, we, if we're debating the revolution word. We didn't have a transformation of the learning and teaching experience. The experience I had in the 1980s, 1990s of school is not that different from now. But my life in the 1980s, 1990s is very different from today. So the question is, yeah, is that right? Is it not? And that's the question that you is. The future of our education force needs to sort of need to think about. So I want you to have a couple of minutes, just have a chat with the people around you. If you're not around anyone, get up and move and get near someone. I just want you to have a think about what your experience of lockdown learning was. What kind of experience was it? How did it make you feel? What words would you associate with that kind of experience? Okay, just a couple of minutes, just have a chat about it. So learning or teaching, whatever context you're in.
Okay, finish off what you're saying about 15 seconds. you there Okay, give me some, how did it feel? Come on. Lots of, lots of Gross. Good, let's start there. What else? Lots of frustration I heard. Yeah? yeah? In what way? Frustration with? I, I'll give like two examples. So yep. I studied my bachelor's degree in COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let's go back to the gross for a second, because yeah. I feel like I want to unpack this a little bit. Yeah. So I was also studying my bachelor's degree during COVID, mm -hmm. um, and I am a language, I got my bachelor's degree in French and Spanish, and trying to do languages, learning languages is such a scope of thing, mm -hmm. and trying to do that on Zoom, where 90% of the other students didn't have their cameras on, weren't communicating, it was essentially just me and Jose, <laughs> um, and it was, it was really tough because you then get to the other end of it and like a couple of the lecturers actually got like really bad like feedback from students because the students were failing mm. because they weren't interacting in class and it was kind of that like well there's only so much you can do you really need to be able to talk and discuss these things but he they put us in breakout rooms and there would be little Anne she's sitting there in her pajamas looking kind of like crap but still there with my camera on and everything and just people were just 
No power. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. What else? Anyone else got something they want to throw? Yeah. It was. That's, sorry, that sentence shouldn't fit together. Yeah. The watch a three hour video, have fun. Yeah. These should be so separate. They should yeah. be. I just feel that they took the most consistent and really take the long one and tried to draw Tony Carrot with his finger on the face. Which I'm sure people that are good at it can do really well. a lot. I just started laughing. <laughs> 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 We're having an emotional breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's difficult for, for lecturers and teachers. Totally. Totally. Uh, sorry, I'll go ahead. Yeah, first. we were talking about really teaching and hearing and hearing for purpose. Mm. So yeah, it would be good. I'd say, like, oh, like cameras. And then you'd be like, come on, guys. And then <laughs> no one would respond. And you couldn't break and you couldn't show frustration and you couldn't turn your own camera off and you had to just be on. Yeah. It was the most painful thing. It was horrible. And Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we, um, so we of course obviously discuss Catherine and what <coughs> to Catherine as well, but we also discuss about how access to technology is still a issue, even in New Zealand. Yes. Like, I've just got, I'm studying as well, and so far my mind is just saying that, you know, it was really hard for, like, the, some of the students who had to share our laptops with their brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and their parents, so they had to negotiate when they could. And there was, yeah, and that's a really, really good point is the, that kind of device and digital equity around, and it's not just does everyone have a device, it was suddenly we became very, very acutely aware that people may not even have the right study spaces within their, their home and that's why they didn't want to have the camera on because actually my only study space is my bedroom and I don't want you to see my bedroom because this is my private world and you're not part of my private world. And that's fine, you know, I, I don't expect to be able to go do that. But you know, there suddenly it just became this whole world of getting into people's spaces that as educators we probably shouldn't be going into, but that left us with black cameras and low interaction and trying to be like this super excited, like, come on, let's do this. And, is anyone still alive out there? Like, can you at least give me a thumbs up to tell me you're breathing? I had one situation where there was somebody who had a camera um, and um, they were supposed to be contributing at a certain point and the other two members had to contact them to wake them up. Yeah. Um, so they just, they go into the morning and they turn it on and they go, okay, that's it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what we've got, and if we go back to the Whakatoki at the start, if we look back to try and plan our forward, 2020 was probably the worst experience for education in the modern history, in that we weren't ready, we weren't prepared, and we had no idea that something like that was even possible. I had the most bizarre moment where, at the time, I was teaching a workshop on how are we going to interact with offshore international students who couldn't enter because of the border closures. And one of the, one of the people in the, in the room just goes, um, we've just announced a full lockdown. What are we going to do? I was just like, I'm going to get a coffee. 
and I don't know, and then in five minutes I'm going to tell you what we're going to try and do. But it was that kind of pace, like we were trying to work out things so rapidly that we fell back on some really bad things. That was when I was at Auckland Uni. Yeah, they tried to change the structure and everything. Yeah. But I think, and I'm really glad that you brought up the positive because there is huge positives in that we had this forced preparation, forced readiness had to happen where, you know, we had, 2020 was pretty awful. 21 was a little bit better. 22 was a little bit better. Now we've got to make the decision of are we continuing to learn from that experience or are we just going to wash it away? And that's kind of our decision that we've got to make. We're not likely to see another kind of COVID thing for a while, hopefully not for a long time. But one of the things that I was kind of caught up when and thinking about quite a lot during that time was the technologies that we fell back on. And what we fell back on is we wanted to do live, synchronous, online, everyone here in this moment do this thing. That was the worst thing we could do. What we probably should have been doing is going, okay, how can we set things that if your bandwidth's gonna mess up, you can come offline, do the activity, go back online, get the next part of something, come back off, do this thing. So there was kind of this on and offline thing happening. And maybe we didn't need 30, 40, 100 people all interacting at the same time because they weren't going to. Maybe we needed, you know, okay, five of you, 10 of you are gonna connect in this moment and then another group are gonna connect at another time Maybe that would have worked better. I don't know. Hindsight's, but yeah, 2020, right? Um, I've just opened another thing on your Canvas course, and I just want you to really, really quickly have a think about the kinds of technologies that you have taught or learned with. What kinds of technologies? So what kind of tools? What kind of things have you used? Oh, someone's, yeah, like and subscribe disappeared again. Mm. And feel free to talk while you're doing it. Quiet room suck. No, no, in general. In general, sorry. I realise talking COVID kind of led us to this point, but... Yeah. I think only the person creating it can do it.
I hope you haven't been teaching with endless two to four hour pre-recorded videos. Okay, so I'm going to stop you in just a minute. And one of the reasons for doing this activity is if you want, there's going to be a button somewhere around here, I can't remember exactly where it is, that says Remake, and you can just hit that and save your own copy of it. So you've got this for your own records, or it's going to be sitting in Canvas anyway for you. But I'm really interested. Um, this one, Blook Clip? Blook it. I haven't heard of this. What, what's this? Yeah, so it's, it's a quiz, um, but it has the questions where you can put your questions to your students and do something else. It's more cool. of a game of So they will play a little game with the quiz and then get more credit if they have to answer more questions. Mm. And they can interact with other players and like get their credit. <coughs> so they quite love it, especially the year nine and mm. ten. Um, That's cool. Yeah, Because that's the problem with Kahoot. It's like bang, 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 yeah, bang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it can be good if it's just like one of those real quick fire type things, but that sounds really interesting. Yep. Well, that's very cool. Anything else here that you're interested in that you want to hear more about from the person that wrote it? I want to hear less about the endless two to four, two, two to four hour lecture. <laughs> Gim kit? What's that? So, and this is me going off on a tangent, which I always do. One of the things that I always look for with the technologies is how can I get students creating? Because if I spend hours and hours making something that takes them five minutes to create, to, for them to do, that's not so good. Whereas if they can be the creator of their of these artifacts themselves, then they're learning at the same time. So things like, and I don't know if these tools can do it, but yeah, if look at if they could create their own quizzes, yeah, you know, like, hey, this side of the room, you're going to create a quiz, and then you're going to be quizzing this group. Like straight away, that's pretty fun, right? Because you want to smash them, like that's fun, but you need to know the answers as well. So. It's, that's the sort of thing I try and look for and create is moments where I'm not necessarily the one doing all of the creation, but I can give students the moment to create. Even things like this, so we used a Padlet just to do a bit of a brainstorm. There's another tool that I use quite often called Answer Garden, answergarden.ch, which you just type in a word and then you just have this um, basically an embedded wall and it just pings up, and the more people write something, the bigger that word becomes. And it's quite fun just watching the words come up. So um, another tool that I use quite a bit is a tool called Twinery, where students um, can create, if I say branching scenarios, do you know what that means? 
Yeah, so like pick a path adventures. So if I want to go, if I'm teaching, I don't know, a first aid module, and I want to know, do they know what happens if they make the wrong choice at this moment? What is the consequence of that choice a couple of down, downstreams? Because quite often, you do something and it's like, you forgot to clip in blah, blah, blah's carabiner. They, they fell off the rock and died. It's like, oh, that's not great. Like, it just was instant. And the world doesn't always do that. It's better if it's like, you forgot to do this thing. That's led you to here, which has led you to here. And then this thing has happened. So it's quite nice to do that. And having students create those moments is even even cooler. But one of the one of the things we were talking about a little bit earlier was about how technology hasn't changed much. When I first started my PhD, I started looking at the history of ed tech. And back in 1890, they had these things called magic lanterns. And I got kind of interested in these things. And I started hunting out what they are, because they were in classrooms, but I couldn't find out what they were. So I went back and tried to find out what they were. And I found this thing from 1671, okay? So this has a picture in it, and as you're, te as you're teaching, you push this along, this is a candle with a little light that's projecting onto the wall. Okay, so the picture is changing all the time. Eventually, that became this magic lantern idea. It's exactly the same. That's why I'm saying that you know we've had this big change in education. Uh, it's a big change in society, but not this big change in education. Yeah. The only thing different between this mid-19th century lecture where the person is projecting an image on the screen, everyone's sitting around in rows watching it, is that I don't have a big stick. It's really the only thing in this moment right now that's different. And that's where there's that question of, should we change it? Should we not? That idea of pre-recorded videos, like we went back to COVID. Yeah, what did we do? Oh, let's roll out last year's lecture. You can just watch that. And I was like, well, where'd that, where'd that idea come from? Followed that back. 1940, uh, Second World War. How did they train all their troops on how to fight when they were overseas? They sent out videos. They all watched them. Sorry? Films. 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 Yeah, not videos, sorry. Films. Like film, real to real film. So in 2020, when our world fell apart, we used 1940 to 1945 educational methods. Yeah. Anyway, what will change it is generative AI, in my opinion. Chat GPT, deep AI, all these things. And at the moment, the big conversation is around, do we ban it? And personally, why would we? Like, the world is changing, and again, do we want to prepare people for a changed world, or do we want to keep them in the world that we had? But the world is changing, and you know, there's huge conversations all through everywhere at the moment, and when you get into schools and start talking about assessments and things, this will come up. How do you know your students created that piece of work? How do you know ChatGPT didn't write it? Prepare yourself, because that's the conversation you're going to have day in, day out. Okay? And the answer is you don't. You have no idea. What you can do is have them doing things in the classroom to see them doing it. And that's probably the only solution we've got for it. But anyway, um, so. Where I wanted to get to, and we've kind of gone round and round a few different ways and hopefully not too boringly got there, is 
the critical part, that technology has changed, the world has changed, but pedagogy has to come before technology. We have to have a reason for using the technology. What is the purpose that we're trying to do through the teaching? Like, we don't want to go, hey, I found this really cool new app that does what? Not, oh, I think my students really like it. And it helps them collaborate, it helps them do better critical thinking, it helps them reflect, it helps them do what? Just, if it's just, I found the shiny cool thing, it's probably not a good enough reason to use the tech. Have you ever seen this? Some? Most people are saying no, so you'll have to head through before again. Yes, yes, yep, very similar, very similar. So PicRat or SAM are very similar sort of approaches. Um, you, go, you go with one of the two. For today, I just chose this one because it's a bit, kind of a, I find it a little bit easier to follow. But essentially, what it's doing is it's a, a framework that goes, what is your intention of using the technology? What are you trying to do? And then once you know what your intention is, you can go, how effective was I in doing it? Okay, it's not saying that this is what you should be aiming for all the time. Okay, this is not always the most appropriate thing. And this, this model is actually quite, um, it's not a great one in that what some people classify in one area, someone else will put somewhere else. So it's, those boundaries are quite porous. But the idea is that, yeah, we've got this top one, the substitution. You're using technology, but you're using it just for its own sake. Okay, so for instance, instead of having a paper handout, it's a PDF on Canvas. Nothing's changed. Okay, instead of handwriting, you're typing in Word. Nothing's different there. Um, often people do like online forms. This is all substitution. I could just get you to handwrite on a piece of paper or on a post-it note. And it takes me no time to create that, whereas a Google form takes me a bit of time. Okay. Again, not necessarily a bad thing, but it is what it is. Augmentation, this is where you're starting to use some of the advantages of digital technologies. So things like Kahoot. And where that would work is students don't always want to put their hand up to signal that they've got a right or wrong answer. Okay, especially in things like large rooms or we haven't got a big high trust group yet. They don't, people don't want to show that they don't know. So you could use something like Kahoot or some type of technology. You could just go pop quiz, write it down, but you're doing it in a slightly different way. Modification, this allows you to redefine your task a little bit. Uh, sorry, redesign um, your task, I should say. Um, so things like uh, hyperlinks within assignments, um, multimedia, students creating multimedia things, stuff like that. Um, in art history, it could be that instead of showing a slide projection, it's a three 360 degree photo of the gallery, something like that. And then redefinition, the learning gets fundamentally transformed because of the use of the technology. Virtual field trip, uh, we had a, an, a session not that long ago with a researcher based in the States and we Zoomed and had a chat to her. There's no way we'd ever have that opportunity without the tech. Okay, and it was very much uh, sharing our stuff, getting feedback on it in a 
through, through Padlets, through Miro boards, things like that, all very live, very different kind of ways. Maybe getting students creating, um, creating their own technologies. So, this time, I'm just going to flick past a couple of slides and open all these. What I want you to do is have a think about, oh, sorry, don't want that one. Have a think and pop onto the different boards with activities that you have used or ideas that you have or things that you've done in either teaching or learning or anything like that and where you'd put them. Okay, so it could be when I teach, I do this activity. Where would I categorise that? Where would I put it? Okay, so what you need to think about is what is your activity? What do you get your students to do? What is your intention in terms of what are you trying to do with the technology? And what I'll do is I'll put that SAMR uh, description back online. Okay, so there's four different boards to populate. Okay, have, have a chat while you do it.
Okay, let's have a quick look at what you've got. Yep. This looks a bit more lively. Substitution looks a bit boring, but that's what I expect from substitution. <laughs> what have, anything in this augmentation that anyone wants to talk about or talk to? There's quite a lot of interesting bits here. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's where cut out things and, and then to say that oh you just use Canva, but it's kind of better because you can source more mm. pictures and you can format the text and so on and so forth and then give it the it's a tiny little thing. Yeah, that's where that, that porous bit between the two yeah. happens because if it was just literally you can make a poster or a canva yeah. and they're essentially the same thing then I'd put that in, all, in uh, substitution. If the Canva then had things like hyperlinks to other resources or some kind of interaction, then straight away that would change it for me. Um, totally, yeah. Or, um, yeah, you could have, yeah, it goes over, this group is gonna do this part, and you're collaborating with another group that's going to do this other bit, um, that would totally move it into another space as well. Yep, what else have we got? Yeah, Kahoot, Ginkert. Does anyone want to talk the random number generator for uh, participation? Yeah, I like this idea. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like, because it's random, well, randomish, <laughs> it doesn't feel like I'm picking on a particular kid, because it's very easy as a teacher to, f you, subconsciously you're kind of, you're gravitating to certain people without even knowing it. Yeah, sorry, there was a hand. Um, we did, I did a session a long time ago with a group from Indonesia and I didn't know how strong their English was going to be so instead of doing like a, uh, a written introduction 
like, because I wanted to know a little bit about them before they arrived in the country and started doing, like, in-class sessions. So I actually got them to go on, like, a powtoon, like a cartoon generator thing, and create their own introduction uh, cartoon. And that was kind of, yeah, a little different. Kind of, it felt like they could have a bit of fun with it. Yeah. Uh, modification. Yeah, I love these, these simulations. There's some really great ones. Uh, create our own vocab lists. Brilliant, nice. Padlets talk about the books for pleasure we've read. Oh, I, I like this. Yeah. Video editing. Students film their own videos and add effects, soundtracks. Cool. Who's this one? Yep. Do you want to speak to it at all? I think video editing is very different for people who get really shy, like if you have to do some kind of role play and it's in front of the class, that can be quite taxing for certain people, whereas doing it and having the ability to do it multiple takes and then going, actually, I'm okay with that one, like that seems to be very different for them and that works and it's a lot more inclusive, so yeah, I totally agree. And if they're going to have a phone, why not use it? Use it for your your devices rather than theirs. Cool. Uh, okay, the redefinition. 3D modeling and simulations. I was looking that way already, thinking I know where this has come from. There's a progression happening here with this. <laughs> what you got? So cool. Uh, protein synthesis?
they wouldn't be able to see it without you to give them the right tools. Mm. So cool. Uh, yeah. So, like, you wouldn't be able to compare a film and a text without um, and video or something like you just watch the whole thing. Yeah. And it's kind of the same way about like totally social awareness one. Very cool. And the last one. Um, just like this right, the example thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, having that structure, that space, um, and often those things like Canvas have, or Teams, you can have that sort of side chat about things as well. Yeah, I'll just drop this file for you, you might need to look at blah, 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 blah. Cool. So the last thing that I want to go through is what looks like a really confusing diagram if you haven't seen this before. Have you seen this? Most people seem to be kind of yes, kind of no. Um, basically, it's a model that looks at when teachers start working with technology, how does that impact on what they need to know about? And how do they become very good at doing so? And it comes from these, these two authors who seem to every article switch who's the first author. They just seem to bounce between them. Um, and so, uh, Michelle and Cola kind of introduced it, then refined it themselves for the next article, and it seems to just kind of constantly have this re refining thing. But this, this piece shouldn't be too unusual to you. As a teacher, what you're going to need in general is to know about your content. Okay? You need to know what, you, what you're actually teaching. You need to know your content area. And you need to know the, how to teach. Okay? So those are the first two levels. When we introduce technology, there's also this need to know about how to work with and how to think about the technology itself. So using the technologies, you can do anything you know, a ton of different activities with a ton of different technologies. It's, again, I'll go back to, it's the intention, what you're trying to achieve. A Padlet is just as good as the Google Doc, depending on what your intention is. And quite often, I'll just put up a Google Doc and we'll just have a collaborative writing session. And it will look crazy, it'll be chaotic, they'll just be typing everywhere. But that's kind of the purpose. That's the point of it. Um, some lecturers quite often you know, don't ask questions, put them on the bulletin board, or the discussion board afterwards. I, when I was teaching down at Winsec, I used to have a Google Doc that was running for the session. If you had a question that came up during the session, throw it in the Google Doc. The last 10 minutes, we'll go back into the Google Doc and see if your question's been answered. If it hasn't, we'll answer it. Or if it's a longer question, we'll go back to it. That sort of thing, but knowing how to, 
how to problem solve within technology is quite an important thing for an educator. So when we put these three things together, we end up with these overlaps. And the first of those is pedagogical content knowledge. What's the best way to teach this particular content? Okay, which you should all be experts at at this point. Okay. When we add the technology in, what's the most appropriate technologies for this type of content? Okay, there are certain technologies that won't work for certain types of content. So the simulations you were talking about for biology, brilliant. Okay, um, yeah, other ones would be less, less uh, comfortable. Like, what is it called? I keep thinking of like scratch pad. Is that the right word? Probably less likely to be useful for biology. Like a little scratch. It was like a mouse that ran around in a little maze that you programmed. And then knowledge about how you teach with technologies. Okay, so what is the right technological tools to use for your content? And then how do you use them for teaching? Which, when we put it all together, we get that, that piece in the middle. So when we add technology on, we're actually adding and asking a lot of a, of a teacher. Okay, and that's what this is essentially saying is, We'd, previously, all we had to think about was, what's my content? Do I know about teaching? And what's the best way to teach my content? Now we're adding on all of these other pieces to go, what is the best way of teaching with these technologies and these approaches? Okay, so just a, it's not anything revolutionary, it's just something to kind of have in mind of, you know, for some, for some teachers, it's a big thing to change and add technology on, and just doing a little step each time is often the best way to do it. Any questions around this one? Uh, makes sense? Cool. Okay, I'm not gonna worry too much about that summary. Uh, and your last thing which is your ticket out of class. So hopefully this one will work. I'm not sure if it will. This is the one I decided to do in a different tool. I think you have to go to this site and put in that game code. And it will just ask you how you feel today a new idea from today and something you're still confused about from today. screen and because you're teachers I thought you'd actually want like everyone always does to have my session plan for the day which I've just published for you I never completely follow it but there's always a there's always a plan just never completely followed and the other thing I've just opened up for you is this, which is an interactive book that goes through everything we've done. So it's got all the, the padlets and stuff embedded in it. And basically I've taken out where my slides have come from. You've got the lit review that they originally came from. The bits, the sections from those. Okay. Otherwise, 
I'm open for any questions or you're welcome to bail whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Ending, ending, ending. <laughs> Thanks for a great session. Really enjoyed it. And good luck with your upcoming jobs. Thank you. Yeah.